Thank you for considering the Corporate Cowboys podcast one more time as we continue with Hitman Online, a technical manual for independent contractors. Originally published 1983 by Paladin Press, written by Rex Farrell. That's the Wild King. Uh, it's a pseudonym. Narrated by yours truly, Alex, a corporate cowboy. Follow us and subscribe to keep this operation not for profit. You can do so on Patreon. That's the Corporate Cowboys podcast. Follow us on Instagram, and there are links available. I'm sure you're a smart, intelligent, reasonable person. Shoot us a donation, which will go towards Andy and all ex- any and all expenses, including legal fees. A disclaimer on the manual written in by the author and or publisher and I and supported, advocated by myself, the narrator, because I won't be held responsible. It goes warning. It is against the law to manufacture a silencer without an appropriate license from the federal government. There are state and local laws prohibiting the possession of weapons and their accessories in many areas. Severe penalties are prescribed for violations of these laws. Neither the author, nor the publisher, nor the narrator, myself, assumes responsibility for the use or misuse of information contained in this book. It's for informational and educational purposes only. With that said, on to chapter 9. Legally Illegal. Enjoying the fruits. Legally illegal. Foresight is better than hindsight. An old saying goes, which is why all through this book, I have stressed the importance of covering your tail as you carry out your job assignment. Disguises, false identification, constant movements, all may have seemed extreme. But are they? Indeed not. Such extremes can mean the difference between a professional job and beginner's luck. The professional walks away from his job with confidence and has no need to look back. The amateur hurries away looking back over his shoulder and lives in fear that he might have left some clue behind to bring the authorities calling at his door. Legal Identification False identification plays an important role in covering one trail. And using them requires a certain flair for dramatics. You must be just as comfortable with your assumed identity as you are with your own. You will have to learn to confidently display your false credentials so you will not arouse suspicion. Where do you get these false identifications? There are several good books and sources available on the subject. You can order them from several dealers who advertise in magazines or newspapers. You can find a source, quote unquote, of stolen IDs of your own, or you can make them yourself. I have a friend who has his own profitable business. He borrows, quote unquote, the stash of big drug dealers and ships the goods out of state to sell. He says it's his way of helping the local authorities keep the home front clean. Every time he hits a doper, he relieves everyone present, not only of his stash, but also any weapons, cash, jewels, and other valuables that he can carry away. He figures that since it's legally considered armed robbery anyways, he may as well, he may as well of the whole route, he may as well of the whole route with gusto. He figures that since it's legally considered armed robbery anyways, he may as well of the whole route with gusto. He may as well of the whole route. I don't know. That might be a, a mistype, a, a, a grammatical error. But, I mean, shit, this is, this is third tier now. It went through the author, through the publisher, perhaps an editor, and now I'm narrating it. For him, I am able to, pr- from him. From him, I am able to purchase, at substantial savings, many throwaway weapons as well as a wide assortment of various identifications. I prefer to use out-of-state papers, and he does his best to provide them for me. He knows I'll pay top dollar for sets. 
that is driver's license, major credit cards, social security cards, and the like, all issued in one name. Yeah, that's a set, that's a set of ID. The first thing I have to do to make the sets I purchase usable is to replace any photographs of the real owner with a photograph of myself. Using a sharp razor blade, I separate the backing from the card as carefully as possible, providing there is a backing. Then I carefully remove from the card as carefully as possible. Uh, <laughs> I reread that sentence twice. Hold up. Using a sharp razor blade, I separate the backing from the card as carefully as possible, providing there is a backing. Then I very carefully remove the photograph that appears on the form and substitute a passport or appropriate sized picture of myself using the appropriately colored background. I attach it with a small bead of clear drying glue from the backside. Okay, so we're talking the 80s. Most identifications nowadays are printed and contain holograms. There are several additional steps that need to be taken in order for a fake ID to work in the 21st century. This, <laughs> the shit from the 80s won't fly. I, I just my commentary, that shit will not fly. A razor blade, I mean, you could use that razor blade for something else, but it ain't gonna be for splicing IDs. Not anymore. Once the photograph dries into place, I take a photograph of my new identification and take film to a guy I know who is an enlarger. He blows up the finished one piece identification to the proper size and I carefully cut it out and blue and blue hang glue the backing that came from the original into place on the back of the photo. Then I cover the entire document in clear acetate so it looks like the real thing. Bending and twisting the finished product takes off the new look to make it look more authentic. He says he blows up the finished one piece identification to the proper size and then it's carefully cut out and glued and, and glue the backing that came from the original into place on the back of the photo. So you're gluing a picture of an identification card onto the front of an identification card to give it uh, I'm assuming the thickness, like a, a more authentic thickness, because if it comes out of the printer, it's not going to uh, be adequately thick. Um, yeah, I mean, I want to say good luck. Good luck with that, because this, shit, this, this is 80s tech. This could be state of the art in the 20th century. But it won't fly in the 21st. I'm sorry. I then store my sets of identifications in a safe place until I need to use them professionally. And when I do use them, it is for identification purposes only. Never make any purchases on the stolen credit cards. Clerks generally don't verify credit card accounts only for verification. Cl clerks generally don't verify credit card accounts only for verification. What the f uh, Clerks generally don't verify credit card accounts only for verification. Maybe they don't tap the cards. Maybe they don't, they don't set a hold on some funds. But this is 80s. Like now in the 21st century, cards are verified. Cards are tapped. There's a deposit that's typically withheld for a certain amount of days while you're conducting business with an organization, like staying at a hotel. They'll tap a deposit on your card. Um, and that is for verification purposes. So be wary of that. What shame. Hold on. What shame. Clerks generally don't verify credit card accounts only for verification. What shame that careless use of a stolen credit card should make short work of what might have been a profitable career. If I use any ident if I use any identification sets on a hit, those sets are immediately destroyed as their use ends. Burn the cards or cut them into bits and bury or scatter in the wind. It's just another part of covering your trail. Legal money. In chapter 8, I emphasize the importance of controlling your ego and being careful how you spend your newly earned money. This is uh, came out of, what is that, part 9? Came out of part 9. So if you want to go back, the audiobook is listed in parts on the Corporate Cowboys podcast channel. You want to look at, I believe it's now season 4? Season 4, part 9, and I will contain uh, chapter 8. Of this manual. In chapter 8, I emphasize the importance of controlling your ego 
and being careful how you spend your newly earned money. As a professional, you have the option of keeping a low profile and living a quiet life, requiring only the basic necessities, or by constructing dummy corporations and laundering, quote unquote, quote unquote, laundering the monies you earn, changing your lifestyle completely. One time tested and proven method of being able to legally use the monies you earn without fear of discovery does not require a great deal of business knowledge or sophistication. For many years, the Bahamas, the Cayman Islands, Guatemala, Panama, and other small poverty-stricken countries shat, shat, do not tax, uh, hold on, and other, for many years, the Bahamas, the Cayman Islands, Guatemala, Panama, and other small pro poverty for many years, the Bahamas, the Cayman Islands, Guatemala, bear with me, folks. I apologize. It's because of some of the typographical errors and grammatical errors contained in this manual, not by, not through fault of my own. I'm trying to fix and improvise in real time while remaining true to the authentic, uh, let's say, spirit of the Hitman technical manual. Bear with me, please. Thank you. For many years, the Bahamas, the Cayman Islands, Guatemala, Panama, and other small poverty-stricken countries sh shat do not tax their own impoverished citizens. What? That. That. Yeah, okay. That was an S to a T. Got you. For many years, the Bahamas, the Cayman Islands, Guatemala, Panama, and other small poverty-stricken countries that do not tax their own impoverished citizens have lifted the country's standard of living and created jobs and businesses for their people by supplying us foreigners with tax havens to launder our illegal money. And they offer ironclad protections to us against snooping U.S. officials and agencies. The procedure is really quite simple. You form a corporation in one of these countries and put your illegal monies into that corporation. You then form a legal U.S. corporation as your business and borrow the money you need to get going from the corporate, from the for, foreign corporation. You then form a legal U.S. corporation as your business and borrow the money you need to get going from the foreign corporation you have previously set up. The stiff fees you pay to the foreign government for this privilege ensure the privacy and protection of true ownership. Um, uh, I'll comment more on that later as far as setting up holding companies to, uh, launder funds derived from questionable sources. We're not, we're not going to claim that they're going to be outright illicit and illegal. This chapter is titled legally illegal, but that encompasses a lot of gray area. You can make anything legally illegal. You can make anything illegally legal. Cognitively, consciously, it just takes practice. It's logic and tact. That's been the overall theme of the Corporate Cowboys podcast. Working in the gray and having it work for you. Let's say your legal American corporation is a land development company because you want to invest your laundered monies into real estate. A foreign corporation in the Bahamas, your own secret corporation and in parentheses, has agreed to lend you funds to back your new American corporation. From the money you acquire from the loan, you will meet your legal business expenses. You will pay rent on your office space utilities. Utilities. You will pay rent on your office space utilities, phone, salaries, and so on. As an executive, your salary is bound to be a large one. Those working with you will also require large salaries commensurate with their abilities. What executive can function without a personal secretary? As an executive, you will more than likely have an expense account and a company car. The car will have to be a really fine one to impress business associates and clients alike. You may also have a profit sharing plan, retirement benefits, or group insurance. With all this legality behind you, now you are free to wheel and deal in the real estate of your choice. When tax time comes around, you will do what every patriotic American does. Fill out your tax return. On that return, you will take all the legal deductions for your business expenses 
interest payments on the loan you got from that big Bahamas corporation and an assortment of small business related deductions you are allowed to participate in American Free Enterprise. You have become part of the system. Your money and your lifestyle are above suspicion. Your lifestyle is just about as your lifestyle is justifiable by your legal income. Your time cannot be unaccounted for. Busy executives do their business on the golf course in jet planes for from their homes and quite often from out of town. You are no longer obligated to punch a clock or account for your working hours or abscess absences. From a financial point of view, you have become totally legally illegal. Semantics. Fucking semantics. You know, that's just a comment on my part. It's fucking semantics. Legally illegal. Okay. Next, legal aid. By their own admission, law enforcement officers clear only a little more than 20% of the reported crimes in a given year. Less than half of those suspects arrested are ever convicted. Fortunately for those of us who support ourselves from outside of the law, the American justice system is so bogged down in technicalities, overcrowded jails, plea bargaining, and a host of other problems that even if charged with a serious crime, we can rest assured that the law is on our side and rarely that of the victim. Damn, that's a cold ass paragraph. I'm not going to reread it. You can rewind that shit. But what do you do if you happen to get picked up for questioning? Most important, remember that you are innocent until proven guilty by a court of law. Some people feel guilty until they can prove their innocence. Never assume this type of attitude, even if they catch you with the barrel of the gun still smoking. <laughs> Damn, this... This little section right here under legal aid, I like it. I like it. Being legally minded myself, I like it. I like it a lot. Most important, remember that you are innocent until proven guilty by a court of law. Some people feel guilty until they can prove their innocence. Never assume this type of attitude, even if they catch you with the barrel of the gun still smoking. You are under no moral or legal obligation to furnish information that may incriminate you. The first thing you should do is find out whether you are being formally charged with a crime. If you are, demand your right to an attorney to guide you during questioning and keep quiet until they arrive. You should already have a good attorney picked out. The attorney should be a good criminal trial attorney, not the one who prepares wills or corporate papers or handles divorces. Preferably, he will be just a bit crooked in parentheses, as most successful lawyers are. Although expensive, if he can save your hide, he is worth the price, whatever it might be. A good attorney will never plead his client guilty, nor will he accept any bargain that will get you time in prison. He knows that his job is to keep you out. Yeah, I mean, by a show of hands... Yeah, for those listening, by a show of hands, who would rather stay outside? Who would rather, who would rather run with killers, run with wheelers and dealers, than hang with snitches? There is a <clears throat> back uh, living on the West Coast in the Bay Area. There was a, uh, a former rapper. His name was um, uh, stage name was the Jacka. The Jacka came from a group called the Mob Figures. The Mob Figures. You know, the street lingo. Mob Figures with a Z at the end. The Jacka of the Mob Figures. And, uh, yeah, I mean, weird uh, re weird fact, I guess. His government name was Dominic Newton. And he was a, he was a cool, he was a cool, uh, really cool artist. Really cool artist. Had some really dope lines, really dope bars. And um, low-key a legend. Low-key uh, underground legend of the Bay Area. He has a line in one of his uh, one of his raps that he'd rather risk getting robbed or risk getting killed by a real nigga than be put behind bars by someone pointing a finger. I don't know if that's the exact bar, but it really it it drives the point home that those you surround yourself with. 
you become liable for in terms of their actions, in terms of their own associations. Shit becomes domino-like in effect. Because whatever happens downstream from you, sooner or later will come back to impact you, your life, your career, your livelihood. <clears throat> Returning. Apologies, just a little, just a little sidetrack. You can divulge name, rank, and serial number, but absolutely no personal information. You can divulge name, rank, serial number, but absolutely no personal information. What is that? Serial number? I'm supposing uh, social security? If you're in the U.S. Or uh, birth code? If you're outside? You can divulge name, rank, and serial number. I mean, that's that's typical of that's military in fashion, right? So I guess yeah, if you're in the military and you get popped or something like this, you're gonna have to divulge some form of identification. But absolutely no personal information. So nothing beyond that. You can divulge name, rank, and serial serial number. You can divulge. Hold on. You can divulge name, rank, and serial number, but absolutely no personal information. Find out right away if you are being formally charged with the crime and what the charge is. If you are not being formally charged, there is a restriction on the length of time you may be held. And if charged, usually you have a right to post bond and a speedy hearing before a judge to set that bond amount. This is where it pays to have set aside a bit of that cash. Unless you are a very accomplished and skillful liar, offer no information at all. Do not trap yourself in a web of lies and alibis. Even though it is illegal, law enforcement agents are known for entrapment. Beware of being baited. During the interrogation, they may toss bits of information based on what they think things might have on what on what? Fucking writing. Dur <laughs> During the interrogation, they may toss bits of information based on they think things might have gone down. On how they think things might have gone down to see if they can get a reaction. During the interrogation, they may toss bits of information based on how they think things might have gone down to see if they can get a reaction. They may try to make you break by making you angry. Or they may tell you this is the most professional job they've ever come across and try to get your ego to talk for you. Don't aid them in building a case against you. It is their responsibility to provide enough proof to build a case that will stand up in court. And even if it gets that far, those 12 jurors still have to be convinced of your guilt beyond a shadow of a doubt. If you have covered your trail, used fake disguises and fake identifications, and if there is no trace of a weapon to be found, they will have a hard time proving you were at the crime scene. Remember, it is not up to you to prove you were not there. It is up to them to prove that you were. If you are caught in the act at the scene of a hit, of course that's another story. Against that... Again, you will you will not aid again, yeah. Again, you will not aid the authorities in any way, although you will be a model prisoner. With the evidence available to formally charge you with the crime, it will become paramount for them to prove your motive. They will offer plea bargains, deals, protection, and the like to influence you to lead them to the man who hired you. Man or woman who hired you, okay. Your high professional ethics will obligate you to protect your employer. Your failure to do so will cut off any future job opportunities in this field. Or you may find that you yourself have become the mark. Yeah, man. Motherfuckers who talk get whacked. That's, that's rules. That's law. <laughs> that's code. But aside from this, be aware of those bargaining officials who have already slotted you as an undesirable. You are capable of performing cold-blooded murder for a fee, a far cry from the crimes of passion they usually handle. To them, you are not fit to be part of organized society. 
So you can bet your life, literally, that any protection they may offer will be good only for the duration of their investigation and the trial proceedings that follow. They have neither the manpower nor the funds to protect the likes of you forever and really don't care what happens to you after your usefulness is expended. I read an account in the newspaper recently about a man who turned state's evidence for police protection and his own freedom. Oh, they let him go, all right, but the protection ended right after the trial. So here he is on probation, but at least a free man. And what happens? He gets stopped on the street and frisked by detectives who discover a gun on his person. When the man explains that he carries the gun for self-protection purposes only, since police protection has ended, they do not pay too much attention. Instead, they put him away on a technicality as they knew they could after having used them to get to the real targets of their first investigation. Even if you provide the authorities with nothing and still end up serving time in jail, beware of other inmates who may be bribed to pump you for information about the details of your particular crime. Yeah, that makes sense. On a, on a side note, getting chummy with folks in prison requires trust. T-R-U-S-T. Motherfuckers are smart, intelligent, political in prison. They know how to politic. <laughs> Having worked with people who came out of prison, politicking is what they do half of the day. The other half is working out and making shanks. So, I mean, uh, approach them and, get, and, and, and befriend them at your own uh, risk, at your own risk and benefit. Recently, while Jimmy Chagra was serving time in jail for drug trafficking, another inmate, also a convicted felon, was offered $250,000 and a parole for obtaining taped information to convict Chagra for hitting the hitman for, for hitting, for hiring. Let me fucking start over, Alex. Come on. Recently, while Jimmy Chagra was serving time in jail for drug trafficking, another inmate, also a convicted felon, was offered $250,000 and parole for obtaining taped information to convict Chagra for hiring the hitman who was convicted of killing Judge Maximum John Wood. Fortunately for Chagra, he did not brag or boast to his fellow inmates about his career, about his Fortunately for Chagra, he did not brag or boast to his fellow inmates about his criminal career and was acquitted for the charge. Under the guise of a writer, I queried a law enforcement officer about the use of plants, quote unquote, in the prisons and jails for the purpose of gathering information. Sure, we do it, he said. But isn't that entrapment? I asked naively. Well, you can't use that in court, he admitted. Would you mind giving me an example of how it works? I asked. Well, in my case, for instance, I used to get sent on assignments all over the state. They'd throw me in the cell for a couple of days and my job was trying to get the suspect to talk, he related. Like, one time, I was put in with a fellow who was accused of raping somebody. So, for the first day, I acted real cool. Like, I didn't want nobody knowing my business. The next day... When they brought the mail around, I get two or three letters from women, all telling me what a good lover I am and how they wanted to have me again. So I'd leave these letters exposed on my bunk so the other guy was sure to notice. The next day, more letters of the same type came, and he just had to ask how I came to get so much mail from chicks. I said, man, if you had screwed as many women in your lifetime as I have, and if you were only half as good as me, you'd be getting mail too. <laughs> of course, he had, to, he had to be one up on me, so he started talking about sex, and he admitted to me that he had raped this girl and how he did it. And you got the confession on tape, I asked, trying to look appropriately impressed. Sure did, he answered with a grin. But that confession wasn't admissible in court, was it? I queried. No, but he didn't know that. All we had to do was play the tape back to him and let him know I was an undercover officer and he broke down and confessed in the interrogation room. We got him cold, he said smugly. Damn. 
on a side note, yeah, uh, those tapes, even though inadmissible in court, likely they could play for you uh, maybe before or after an interrogation slash deposition if, if we're doing something civil and could be used to convince, persuade, persuade uh, someone to open up and, and divulge some crucial, incriminating, crucial slash incriminating evidence. Let him who hears listen. Let him who has ears listen. The important thing to do now before the need arises is to gain all the knowledge you can about the law and how it works. So if by chance it ever gets too close for comfort, you will be able to handle the situation wisely. I hope you have found the law enforcement handbook mentioned in chapter one. That's part two for the listeners listening the audio book. Part two of the audio book. I hope you have found the law enforcement handbook mentioned in chapter one and have begun to study your own state laws. State laws vary, but federal law, like the Miranda decision, you have the right to remain silent, in parentheses, are of course applicable throughout the United States. Find out how long the authorities can detain you for questioning before they have to make formal charges. Note any breaches of legal arrest procedures that may make your arrest null and void. How many days are allowed in your rights to a speedy trial? How many days are allowed in your rights to a speedy trial? One day over and they have to be, according to law, thrown out. Learn about making appeals and appealing appeal decisions. Tangle up the authorities in their own red tape and watch them squirm as you squander thousands and thousands of taxpayers' dollars. Establish a good relationship with a good attorney now. Ask him about these things and how the law works from his side of the bench, defending the accused. He won't want to know why you are asking and probably won't pry. And don't ever come right out and tell him what you do for a living. After all, he, is he will be defending your innocence. He will be. After all, he will be defending your innocence. The fee you pay him establishes you to access to his professional wisdom. And the information you get is yours for the asking. Of course, the true test of being a professional is that you won't ever have to face these legal predicaments. Your work methods, low profile, the way you handle your money and professional business, your knowledge and attitude will all be working to protect you. Then, someday, when you've done and seen it all, when there doesn't seem to be any challenge left or any new frontier left to conquer, you might just feel cocky enough to write a book about it. And that's the end to Hitman Online, a technical manual for independent contractors, originally published 1983 by Paladin Press and written by Rex Farrell. I'll reiterate one more time that the book is narrated only by myself. I have no affiliation or association with neither the author who wrote this under a pseudonym, nor the publisher who has since discontinued its publishing of the book. My belief is that this information is informational only and should serve to be informational in purpose as well. Meant to be educational and informational. I am not responsible for what you do with this information. I do not assume any responsibility, nor should you hit me up with any dumb shit that you've done with it. Until then, 